Hi everyone and welcome uh, to I guess the first in a new kind of um, representation of uh, my show uh, which will now be called Everyday Analysis. Um, for people who don't know um, I used to do Everyday Analysis a book series and a blog series with Daniel Bristow uh, and others we were a collective um, run which ran from about 2012 until uh, 2018 or something like that. Um, but um, really restarting in, in a new form and, and doing a series of podcasts as I've been doing um, with Elliot Rosenstock on, on the channel Sci-Fi, where we talk about to psychoanalysts, clinicians and theorists and people in the world of critical theory and contemporary philosophy about current political and popular issues. Uh, the idea of everyday analysis is to use analytic frameworks from psychoanalysis and to a lesser extent other philosophical traditions to analyze everyday life and think about what's going on in the everyday. So I hope people are um, interested and excited to, to hear these, these shows. They'll be out on Sublation Media each week, uh, as was um, my previous show, uh, Sci-Fi. And also there's a Patreon uh, in which I'm doing something a bit different. I'm actually reading um, classic psychoanalytic texts um, there so um, and, and giving a kind of class although I don't know much about them myself learning together with you guys with the patrons uh, so I, I did a class on uh, with Elliot on Freud's essay criminals from a sense of guilt uh, Lacan's mirror stage uh, and this week I did um, Lacan's concepts of the the master and the castrated master and I've been working really hard this week on um, a text by Nicholas Abraham called the kernel and the shell which is a really important psychoanalytic text that's kind of understudied so I read the text out uh, and then give some discussion of it for, for patrons which is just like two pounds if you want to do it the link is in the the bio there so thanks so much for those of you that are doing so um, so yeah welcome to everyday analysis uh, kind of this rebrand i uh, hope it's good for you comments welcome email me everything you can everything you want me to do uh, and uh, i'm really happy to be joined today by uh, Katerina Kolosova, uh, recently listed. What was that, Katerina? You were recently <laughs> named in a list of the 20 most influential women in philosophy. 25. <laughs> 25. I, I don't know uh, uh, what it is exactly. I, I mean, I, I know, but I'm not that familiar with the website. It's um, an AI uh, website of ranking of colleges, academics, etc. My daughter discovered it actually because it's uh, very practical. Uh, she's looking for a, a college. She's going to study acting, theater acting, mm -hmm. and so it's uh, uh, you know it's not elitist. It's not about prestige. Or it's uh, it's a very uh, custom made, and you can adjust it to your particular needs. Like I want to study in a public college in Germany acting in german so where do i look and uh, it's uh, it, it's an ai thing uh, i checked the methodology and i really liked it actually yeah, it's very so the, robots, um, yeah. The, the robots I, uh, think you're an influential philosopher at least yeah so <laughs> it's, yeah based on uh, not just the quantity like citations but also quality of influence the the ai reads the way you're uh, uh cited or discussed and that's how they rank you so anyway it's an ai yeah. website uh, well, I, it's I called can, um, academic influence yeah i can tell you that the humans think you're an influential philosopher as well <laughs> <laughs> um but um mm -hmm. But uh, I, and we're really, I'm really happy to have Katerina on. Um, and what we're going to talk about today, though, is a different piece, um, which Katerina's written, uh, a, a chapter which is, in some senses, about um, Zizek, but not really about Zizek. Of course, this mm. he's he's been in the uh, in the news, in the so-called news, with various critiques. But you know, somebody mm. who takes Zizek very seriously, rather than critiquing it in a nonsense way, as we've seen recently. But it's mm. also really about. Um, like subjectivity and object objectivity, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, the, the article's called What is Worth Salvaging in Modernity? Um, and in the end, you, mm -hmm. you, you sort of um, come towards a, a kind of idea of um, non-humanism, mm -hmm. right, right, via Marx, and and, and mm -hmm. advocate for a certain way of thinking, uh, mm -hmm. which is and so so it's really dealing with all sorts of things, right? So uh, whether we should be objective, subjective, it's quite philosophical. But I thought, you know, mm -hmm. I'd start by asking you um, some questions. You know, I think that uh, 
myself and perhaps some of our listeners would would would, uh, would need a bit of clarification on the topics. So I thought I'd start by asking you um, some questions from from what you wrote in this really interesting article, because mm-hmm. um, it, it seems to me that on in like ghosting it is this current um, uh, attitude, I suppose, towards identity and subjectivity in politics. Mm-hmm. So what you say in the article, you say that Marx pro- um, kind of proposes a shift towards objectivism. Um, mm-hmm. And you say it's probably um, an undisputable fact that subjectivity centred thinking and anthropocentric ontology, epistemology and morality have determined the civilizational legacy of modernity. So you say that modernity has become subjectivity centred. And of course, this mm-hmm. immediately makes me think of the kind of identitarian politics of today. Mm-hmm. Um, but you say that Marx's objectivism would offer a an alternative, a response to mm-hmm. um, a subject centred view of the world, which you, I think, trace to, to Kant. Um, mm-hmm. So maybe you could just t- 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 tell us in, in, in your own terms, like, what does this what is this opposition between the subjects subjectivity centered thinking the identity centered thinking mm-hmm. and marx's idea of the objective way of viewing the world uh i think that uh we maybe need to begin uh with uh marx's critique of philosophy in principle uh all philosophy philosophy in general philosophy since greek antiquity to hegel uh, as uh, a form of thought uh, that is regulated, uh, that is organized, that is uh, structured and grounded, and in that way also determined, so um, defined in the last uh, instance, by the logic of subjectivity, which is inevitably human subjectivity. Uh, his uh, a mocking uh, he- uh, Marx is mocking Hegel and his critique of Hegel's philosophy in general in that paper of uh, through his subjective objectivism, you know, objectified, uh, objectified um, uh, 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 universal subjectivity. He's uh, uh, um, he calls this concept uh, the idea of the universal human egoist. You know, so uh, mm-hmm. and according to him, this is simply the apex of all philosophy. This is what philosophy has always been. It has always been regulated, moved, defined by uh, human uh, uh, humanity's project, uh, projection onto the outside uh, world, onto the uh, universe, or onto the external reality or reality itself. Uh, so this is, uh, let's uh, uh, call it uh, the pathology of, of philosophy in general, uh, as uh, Marx puts it. He, he, his, he puts it actually uh, in slightly different words, uh, uh, Hegel's philosophy in general. But he does say that this is just, you know, in a way, the metastasis of any kind of, of philosophy. Uh, Mar- uh, Hegel is uh, indeed the, the apex of uh, uh, philosophy. So, so and, uh, and in order, uh, so this is uh, early uh, Marx, uh, mind you. Uh, critique of Hegel's philosophy in general is part of the philosophical economic manuscripts. So that's the young uh, Marx, or as Althusser would uh, call him, Marx before the so-called epistemological break. But we we find the same reasoning in German ideology, where he uh, refutes. Uh, uh, Feuerbach's materialism as materialism, and he uh, actually identifies the problem with uh, Feuerbach uh, as one, uh, yeah, his problem in the last instance, as a Lillian would say, uh, Feuerbach's problem is that he remains a philosopher, and he states this explicitly. He says, Feuerbach remains a philosopher, not uh, the new kind of scientist that uh, mm. Marx would like uh, Marxism to uh, form philosophers into. Uh, 
a new type of scientist, so yeah. uh, the species be, being of humanity. And he says, uh, Forbach remains entrapped in philosophy. He remains a philosopher. Therefore, his thinking is subjectivity, against human subjectivity centered. And this human subjectivity purports, imagines to be projected or to reflect the the, uh, the outside reality. Um and this is the this uh, narcissistic self mirroring uh, trap of all philosophy, so including Feuerbach's uh, materialism, and uh, yeah, his materialism uh, ends up being idealism pre- precisely mm-hmm. because it's still philosophy. So he does have an issue with philosophy as such, and uh, and he does see the problem uh, in its being grounded in. Uh, human subjectivity as the organizing principle of thought and in yeah. that way I think that you can uh, you as somebody who knows Leroy's work you can see the link between Leroy and uh, Marx and why would Leroy call himself a Marxist he did call himself even in the last book he wrote the Tetralogos yeah, I, I think that's really interesting and, and really important. And I think what, what you one of the things I did want to, which you already mentioned, which I wanted to think about with you was um, this idea of science and the arts and so on. Um, because mm-hmm. you point out that, as you ju- kind of just said, that Marx wants to follow this objectivity and, and, and scientific yeah. exactitude, which uh, he thinks Feuerbach is, is not in the realm of. Whereas uh, what's actually happened in society today is um, the science, scientific exactitude has become reserved for like um, what you know the exact sciences, whereas mm-hmm. the humanities, social sciences have re- become really attached to the subjective perspective. Mm-hmm. Right. And and the other thing I wanted to get you to say something about is I, I found it really interesting that you mm-hmm. kind of contextualize this in, in terms of politics. And I mean, I don't obviously we're not talking you're not talking here about today's politics necessarily because you say that Kant's Kant's own vision mm-hmm. um, could only develop into a liberal or individual centered foundation of a rationally organized society. Mm-hmm. Now, I find that really really provocative because you're saying mm-hmm. that this kind of cogito modeled individualist um, individual centered subjectivity centered mm-hmm. society is what led to the liberalism of today and i think that you know today mm-hmm. on social media we can see everywhere mm-hmm. we look this kind of individual centered rationally organized society mm-hmm. and so i wondered if you could speak to that why do you think that the the the, the, the germs of liberalism are in this way of thinking and and how can it be avoided as it were Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's uh, also important to just briefly describe how Marx sees uh, the, uh, the objectivism he advocates for the science uh, he proposes, which is uh, dedicated to uh, understanding the, uh, as he calls it, the species being of humanity or uh, social relations. Uh, in humanity, uh, human social relations, and their and the ecosystems they establish uh, through technology, of course, to any form of uh, through any form of artifact uh, uh, with nature. Or if nature uh, sounds a bit uh, like a mystifying term, then I don't know. Uh, natural resources, let's call them that way, even though it's a a capitalistic definition, you know, resources, they're reduced to uh, resources. So anyway, uh, the objectivism he he talks uh, about um, is one that would pertain to uh, to this science. So you see, it's very interesting. He is... uh, uh, that's why the epistemological, the thesis about the epistemological break, uh, break doesn't hold. He is a, a humanist in a way because he has always been, not only in his uh, youth, he's always been uh, interested in understanding and explaining uh, human relations, social relations, uh, species being of humanity. Uh, he talks about, you know, reorganization of social relations, uh, by way of reorganizing the economic base of production. So economy is not just uh, economic, economy in the sense of economics. It's more than that. 
uh, the, the very material conditions uh, of, you know, organizing our human social relations uh, universe. Uh, so he is interested in that. He is uh, concerned with uh, how humanity organizes uh, itself, how it produces, reproduces, uh, etc. So there is uh, some interest in humanity. He is uh, he is a humanist in a way, but he is not anthropocentric. He is not human centric. That's why I called him non-humanist toward the end of the uh, uh, paper. And uh, now uh, arriving at the objectivity he talks about, he, he speaks of a type of thought that in a way uh, mimes the position of a third person's perspective so not your own perspective uh, no not your introspection uh projected onto the outside world uh he accuses hegel of doing this actually uh nothing like that uh nor uh from the perspective of the, of, ob of the object which is you know which would entail the master uh, slave dialectic. It's you know this duality of uh, uh, of uh, subject object and the uh, uh, mirroring. Actually, the reflection of the subject onto the object. Liz Irigare, by the way, mm. writes about this in Speculum. She's so often reduced to uh, Lacan and to psychoanalysis. We keep forgetting that uh, Irigare is a Marxist. And she she writes as a Marxist. This sex, which is not one, is a Marxist book. She she based her argument on uh, Marxist analysis of commodity fetishism there uh, in this sex, which is not one. So anyway, objectivity is um, miming miming uh, trying to imagine uh, uh, the. Uh, this third person's per perspective. So it's neither object nor subject. They are not reflected. They are not in this dialectical, let alone master uh, uh, the slave uh, dialectics relation. It's a third person's perspective. It's also not, uh, you know, this sub specia aeternitatis, you know, godlike perspective from above, you know, this perfect, uh, you know, unmistakable objectivity. It's not that. We cannot achieve that. Uh, what we can achieve is uh, miming the perspective of a third person uh, uh, observing you as a subject and also your object of consideration. The, uh, that's very interesting, actually. And uh, in that way, you imagine yourself as the object in the eyes of the third person. That ter third person uh, would be human, presumably, because you can identify only with a human third person. Uh, but the fact that it's a third person makes it, in a way, impersonal. Yet it, it remains uh, a, a, a supposed human perspective. So it gives a really interesting results, but we would go too much into uh, epistemology if I go further yeah. with this elaboration. I just wanted to explain this, that his objectivity has nothing to do with the objectivism of uh, August Comte or the positivists of any sort or, or any type of social science that mimics the exact sciences. But the yeah. exact sciences are the model, as you say. Uh, mm -hmm. and yeah, I will arrive to the, the point of uh, identity politics and mm -hmm. subjectivity and liberalism. Inevitably, the Enlightenment idea, uh, the, this Kantian idea of uh, subjectivity, leads to the liberal Republican, back, back then it was called Republican, right? Not democratic uh, order and the, the notion of the uh, abstract modern uh, state, a state of representation, right? Through parliaments, etc. So already 
you know, alienated state represented through these bodies, such as parliament, etc., and through the abstract notion of the nation as a sovereign, etc., etc. So you can see already, I think, the resonances with how capital works, you know, how capital uh, and, you know, values uh, system and the exchange of values and the logic between value and the material uh, resource. uh, You can see that, uh, you know, there is a reflection uh, of the two uh, in the notion of uh, the understanding and the structuring of uh, the concept of the modern state and capitalist value system and exchange. Um, it is indeed uh, uh, subjectivity centered. And I think that nowadays we're uh, witnessing um, this uh, crisis of this uh, model of thinking, this uh, uh, model of modernity, the so-called post-modernity, which actually never happened. Uh, mm. It's been modernity all along. Uh, what's Postmodern, except certain mannerisms, or you know, uh, maybe the critical position, critical theory, standing at the edge of you know modernism and modernity. But in a way, paradoxically, postmodernism has been you know like taking modernism to its paradoxical absolute. So, uh, so anyway, we are still in an era of modernity yeah. and. Uh, and I think that we're uh, now the, uh, we're suffering from yeah the the types of un, you know they're always healthy psychoanalytically speaking they're, they're always healthy pathologies that you kind of have to keep in order uh, to to stay normal uh, in the Freudian sense but there is all, there are also pathologies that you uh, just have to get read of because they're just you know uh becoming toxic and you know the the, the uh, that it's a core or, or a, an element of a model or a system that's simply falling apart yeah. uh, that's this you know fixation on subjectivity so yeah. politically speaking yeah i'll, I'll wrap up uh politically mm-hmm. speaking that uh there won't be any emancipation of the subjugated masses if we are focused on subjective, uh, you know, uh, responsibility of subjectivization of uh, social solidarity, of uh, emancipation on subjective level, like uh, uh, as if incarnation on on subjective and individual level of certain values um, that in the end uh, comes down to identity politics and you know this uh, billions of individual uh, embodiments and you know incarnations material uh, materializations blah blah, blah. okay. That's uh, my second language uh, of uh, value systems in the form of certain types, not yeah types and also uniqueness uh, of identities. So we are uh, ending up uh, with a with an even more um, yeah particularized. Um, uh, alienated world where we cannot forge alliances, we cannot forge any social change, certainly not overcome uh, this model of capitalist society and economy if we're thinking in this way. So identity politics and uh, uh, the Marxist cause, the cause they're just, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're opposites and no i completely agree with that i i absolutely think i think this and i think this uh, this uh, approach is really important so basically what we're looking at is is and i think this is absolutely right we can't you say we can't have uh a, a rev- any kind of significant change until we do away with subjectivity centered thought mm-hmm. and i i think it's i mean 
you know, I'm, I'm really just summarizing what you've just said. In, so correct me if I'm getting it right. I just want to see if I have. But I, I really feel there's there's something important here in the, and I suppose we're also getting into the pathological, as you put it, the pathological, uh, psycho, psychological dimensions of what's happening today. Because, you know, you're saying that this extreme focus on subjectivity centered thought, this dominance mm -hmm. of subjectivity centered thought, identity politics that comes out mm -hmm. of that is really symptomatic of a, a world in crisis and, and a set of material conditions in crisis. Um, but what it serves to do is mystify that and uh, encourage everyone to think, to do the non-Marxist thing of thinking in terms of identities and subjectivity yeah. and thinking, which actually prevents, you know, solidarity from developing by mm. particularizing us and, and, and avo avoiding a universal mm. approach and avoiding attention mm -hmm. being paid to the material conditions which produce this symptom of identity politics. Would, would that be right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, uh... I don't know. I mean, um, how without uh, sounding ad hominem, uh, and I will uh, avoid uh, ad hominem arguments or mentions of anybody. But you know, um, by affirming your identity while still wearing I don't know uh, expensive Prada dresses or. Um, I don't know, not so expensive, but produced in Sri Lanka fret, uh, sweatshop dresses uh, and affirming your newly, f or they don't have to be dresses. They they can be, you know, uh, uh, differently gendered uh, clothes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, the opposite. <laughs> you, you're not being a, a communist or a Marxist, even though you insist and you, you declare to be one. It's all right. It's fine to uh, you know express yourself in that way, but do not confuse that with uh, Marxism and socialism of any sort. Not caring about how this product were, uh, were produced, the just because you're affirming some uh, you know subversive, which is to be applauded uh, identity. Uh, does not uh, make you a Marxist automatically. You have a certain responsibility toward uh, this, yeah, a responsibility of bu building class awareness, right? Um, we are all supposed to, according to Marx, Marx, to discover that if we are wage la labor, we are proletarians, right? So we are all the proletarian class, regardless of, you know, how highly or low paid. Uh, technically speaking, as a category, you, you've got owners, and you, uh, then you have uh, also associations of free producers. They are both, like you, they're both owners, but they produce. They work for what they produce. Uh, they do not uh, fall into the, the category of capitalists, of course. On the contrary, on several... Uh, places uh, which I have collected in a paper that I'm about to publish in Canada, uh, mm -hmm. he actually says that these associations of free producers, they're both owners and also produce, um, they would be basically the bridge toward the new form of economy, which would be socialist economy, which reminds me a little bit of what we had in Yugoslavia as in, um, self-governance, so the system of self-governance, you know, workers self uh, self governed It was uh, a more uh, an imperfect version, and uh, but still uh, an interesting experiment, actually. And it was in the best years, economic years of uh, Yugoslavia. Anyway, not to go uh, into that direction. Uh, yeah, um, affirming your identity, being uh, focused on that, being focused on your on your individual realization, etc. Uh, even though uh, something you have every right to, and we as socialists we, uh, should support, uh, that does not uh, absolve you if you purport to be a Marxist and a socialist from a certain responsibility toward uh, the conditions in which uh, what you wear, etc., or where you live in, or what you use, uh, are produced. Um, but uh, let me uh, just correct my, myself uh, here. Uh, still, 
you should show awareness about this because of you know this necessity to build, to build class awareness as proletariat. Uh, but on the other hand, being aware of that and you know repenting and apologizing and you know being puritan about that and uh, seeking for clothes that are produced elsewhere in more just conditions, it is again an individualistic liberal answer. So uh, that would not solve the, the problem. The only thing that would solve the problem is changing the conditions of production. Yeah, yeah. Um, great. No, I, I, I think that's a really, really important response. And I, 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 totally, I totally think that's right. I mean, let's come on to, um, you know, before we run out of time, let's come mm-hmm. on to a little bit talking about um, Zizek, I suppose, which is ostensibly mm-hmm. part of this, but not, but not really. Yeah. Um, but but um, you do, in fact, on this topic, uh, talk about Zizek's idea, because you say that Zizek yeah. kind of, you know, you, obviously you take his philosophy extremely seriously, yeah. <laughs> unlike Sam, um, yeah. but you, you show, you say that he demonstrates that yeah. universalism mm-hmm. is the path to true socialist emancipation. Mm-hmm. And you, you also say that this kind of universalism is only possible by way of interrogating the real. So I guess here yeah. uh, a kind of yeah. psychoanalytic sense of thinking comes in here. And obviously you've, you've written also a yeah. fantastic book, The Cut of the Real, which deals with these kind of topics. But um, maybe you can you can tell us um, what you, you know, perhaps you want to say something about Zizek, maybe mm-hmm. you don't. But what do you think, because uh, th- this kind of universalism, um, which is a way of interrogating the real, um, this is this is the opposite mm-hmm. of a subjectivity centered thinking, right? This is a yeah. universalism that cuts yeah. against that. So maybe you can say something about this kind of universalism. Um, yeah. So yes, yeah, Zizek uh, needs to be taken more seriously than he has been taken recently uh, in the past decade or so. Uh, maybe because of his long excursions into cultural uh, theory, which is uh, something I'm not interested in and I'm not knowledgeable about. Uh, What I found uh, in my youth, in my early works from, you know, the beginning of 2000s, useful in his work was uh, his um, demonstration that uh, the instance of the real, the notion of the real, uh is operable it's uh uh, operational sorry Uh, it's useful it uh, could be put into uh, operation in philosophical considerations in particular political considerations and that's where he uh and that's where uh, there is a book in which he demonstrates how this is done uh, in a dialogue with laclo and butler contingency, hegemony, universality. Uh, So I find uh, that uh, part of uh, his work very useful and relevant to my own, and I have um, uh, resorted to to these texts and I have cited uh, them. Uh, I see, however, a problem in him not seeing a problem in uh, subjectivity-centered thinking because he kind of values this and he also um, yeah he, he not only does not recognize uh, the problem, does not state uh, any problem with it but he, he seems to value this he seems to think that this is what is worth you know keeping uh, from uh, modernity and he sees this you know, uh, developed in a full, you know, perfect, uh, almost, uh, yeah, perfect, impeccable form that does not require any uh, remedies Mm -hmm. or revisions in uh, Mm -hmm. Hegel's philosophy. So uh, the Kantian uh, subject that I see Mm -hmm. a problem with and the, the, the fundament of uh, modern, modernity or modernism uh, is, uh, is what reappears in Hegel and again in um, uh, Zizek's uh, takes on Hegel. And there I see a problem with his understanding of uh, uh, universalism. I would... Uh, 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 the, uh, the, uh, the understanding of universalism uh, in Zizek uh, or related to Zizek that I would agree with and I would build on 
it, uh, can be found more in his student, Alenka Zupancic, and her grounding of uh, universalism in the instance of the real as something that can speak, let's say, uh, something that the two of us have been trying to do uh, in our early works and in, in our more recent works, uh, actually. Um, as far as I can tell, the, the, the over, overlaps there. I haven't seen her in years, but I, I think that... Uh, yeah. We yes, had, I, I, um, I interviewed her uh, in Ljubljana, yeah. you know, so uh, yeah. on this panel, so people can can go back and, and find observations. Yes. Lenka. she's she great. She was in uh, Skopje right before COVID, and she gave a lecture here, the Faculty of uh, not uh, Faculty, actually, the Museum of Contemporary yeah. Art, and we saw each other uh, for the last time in person. Then. She came on uh, to speak at the School on Zeno Feminism I organized in 2020. It was the year of COVID, so it was all via Zoom. Let me ask a question about what you were just saying there about that, because I'm interested in how the two parts of this conversation kind of connect. So, so this this term, the real, obviously coming from Lacanian psychoanalysis and this Slovene school, as you say, this Zizek and Alenka's work. Um, but uh, and, and there's a universal solidarity that's made possible by engagement or interaction with the real in a certain mm -hmm. way. This is a psychoanalytic point in some senses. Mm -hmm. And then previously we we're making the point that what's needed is a Marxist idea of mm -hmm. um, solidarity that comes from recognition of the material mm -hmm. uh, reality of things. So how mm -hmm. does the material conditions or materialism relate to the question of the real? Are, are these connected things, This, uh, this, uh, the idea of a, a yeah. solidarity, that's a universalism that's based on uh, a, a, re a recognition or interaction with the real, is that also a Marxist materialist kind of process? I think that the notion of solidarity is again a bourgeois notion. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it has this. Uh, uh, mm. And it's kind of subjectivity. Of some Christian morality or whatever. I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm not sure. I, mm. I have this. The uh, I have an issue with <laughs> the term. Mm, yeah. Well, uh, it sounds. Uh, so solidarity, you could say, was a subjectivity centered way of thinking. Mm. Maybe. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Um, Whereas but, universalism is, but yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, but but the thing is, you do not be build class consciousness by understanding that we have to be in solidarity with one another and identify with our um, mm -hmm. in a sentimental way. In what way? Moral, sentimental. What's uh, solidarity uh, uh, with one another and uh, each other's uh, conditions or the shared conditions? The uh, condition we all have. What Marx says is um, actually the proletariat should recognize uh, its immediate uh, material interests. Material interests, and by changing the material basis of production, so uh, that's why materialism is important. Uh, if uh, if we do not resort to it, we will remain in this um, uh, kind of cycle of subjectivity-centered thinking and you know individual responsibility. And I'm in solidarity with you, but you do not recognize me or whatever. It's all inter-individual if, if you don't resort to the materialist uh, model. Uh, so um, we must change the, uh, the material base of production, of but this is not economic uh, re uh, reductivism, reductionism, what's the, the word? Uh, it's not uh, about a reduction of anything to economy. Uh, it's uh, the other way around. Economy is actually something far vaster, far uh, more general, far more defining of everything that uh, the universe of social relations might entail. So uh, uh, reorganizing the way we materially reproduce our societies, so economy, uh, 
you, uh, relations with uh, nature and natural resources, etc. All of that being redefined, restructure uh, is automatically reflected on how we organize social relations, how, what type of ideologies we might uh, in this way uh, cause to emerge, cause to emerge, they will emerge uh, of themselves by changing this material condition. So uh, the material basis uh, of, you know, the very material reproduction of, of our conditions of existence, uh, what people would call, oh, mere economy, uh, you know, uh, it's merely material. No, uh, nothing is merely material. Uh, 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 th there is nothing mere about that. Uh, uh, the material conditions do, if you're a, a Marxist, you would recognize that material conditions do dictate everything else and everything else will be changed uh, as soon as we change this, uh, well, infrastructure. Uh, uh, social infrastructure. Uh, so we should see economy and the material uh, base in this way. Uh, and that's why the, uh, the materialist stance is so important. And that's why uh, Marx dedicated his entire work basically to uh, developing a materialist uh, yeah, even his science wouldn't be a science without materialism. Uh, it all begins with his uh, doctorate on materialism. Uh, why does he choose the uh, Epicurus and Lucretius, uh, the atomist, uh, the atomists as uh, you know the topic of the, his thesis? Because he says they're the only materialists in the history, the only real materialists in the history of uh, Western philosophy. And uh, this um, understanding of, uh, well, this ontological po position, he, he, he takes uh, an ontological and what some would call a foundationalist choice. He makes a choice. Uh, that's the materialist choice. And it, it is very clear that that is the only, yeah, epistemological precondition for this science that he seeks to establish to uh, not just to, to sustain itself, but actually to, to, to uh, emerge, basically. Yeah. So uh, it's uh, materialism the is the epistemological basis uh, of his science of his uh, political and economic worldview. Um, and as a Marxist, I don't think that you can avoid or compromise uh, uh, with materialism. And on top of everything, he does say that, you know, change will occur and class consciousness will emerge as soon as the working class uh, recognizes its mate immediate material interests real and material he uses the two interchangeably actually yeah. real and material i mean i think that's a really great uh you know, point and and this real and material thing is an interesting mm -hmm. way of also thinking as others have done about the connection between psychoanalysis and mm -hmm. marxism and so on you know i i want us also to stop uh because we've been talking long enough but uh, and i know you you joined us the day after Christmas, Russian Christmas, which is, yeah. you know, didn't, yeah. I didn't even know. I, I knew about Spanish Christmas, you know, on the 6th of January, but I didn't know about it. It's the old calendar, the Julian calendar, that yeah. the Orthodox Church uh, used to refuse to change uh, uh, and resort to the new one. Then, you know, most of the Orthodox countries changed the calendar, but the Russians, the Serbians, and us, we... And, as you say, the Spanish, we are yeah. just, you know, not giving up on the old <laughs> No, but joining, yeah, I mean, of course, it's well into January now, but joining mm. us for you the day after Christmas is, mm. is very generous. So thanks for doing it. And, you know, people can, If I, I think it's been really great to discussion, actually, because, you know, parts of it connect to the long history of philosophy, but also how important that history is when thinking about what we're dealing with today. Obviously, we are at a kind of crisis where, you know, we're seeing the symptoms of our, you know, economic moment cracking up. 
Uh, but these are often mystified and confused into subjectivity centered thinking that really needs opposing from a Marxist perspective. So I, mm -hmm. I personally find this extremely politically important today. So uh, mm -hmm. thanks for, for joining us, Katharina. It's been extremely interesting. And yeah, anything, any last things you want to say? Anything people could no, I, I think I speak too much. My answer is <laughs> no, no, too long. No, I haven't uh, given you a chance to say <laughs> something. Maybe you um, can come back. You, you, you left people wanting more. Thanks for listening, everyone.